Thank you, Dr. Hassel, for joining us. Good to see you here. We are looking down the top 10 archaeological finds. Well, I shouldn't say the top 10, 10 of the top archaeological finds. We looked last night and we saw that the Rosetta Stone was a very key archaeological find helping to unlock the hieroglyphics. We looked at the Solomonic Gates and where would we find those Solomon's Gates? at Gezer, Chatzor, and Megiddo, three sites that the Bible mentions specifically. Did you excavate there? I've excavated two of those sites, Gezer and Chatzor, yes. And you were able to see those Solomonic Gates? Walked over them every morning on the way to work. What did that do for your confidence in the Bible? It made it real to realize that these gates were built during the time of Solomon by the Phoenicians with particular kind of architecture. Yes, it was incredible. The third find we looked at last night was the, uh, that brick. We had a brick that was 2,600 years old, back to the days of Nebuchadnezzar, with Nebuchadnezzar's name stamped on it. You brought a brick like that. We also looked at the town of Lachish, one of the great uh, reliefs about the battles that would take place in the Middle East, particularly in Jerusalem and Lachish. We saw that. And we also looked at a coin, a coin that is actually an authentic coin from the temple tax period that Judas would have received from betraying Jesus. That's correct. We're on find number six. What is it? Well, find number six is an interesting one. A few years ago, we were working at the site of Hatsor, and my wife one day says, I'm going to find a figurine. And she was looking, and, and we didn't take her very seriously, but a few minutes later, she says, I found a figurine, and she lifted up something very similar to this, only missing a head and arms. This is an ancient Asherah figurine from Israel, a figurine that is often put together with the god Baal. So when the Israelites came into conflict with varying pagan Canaanite tribes, these tribes would have worshipped a figure like this. That's correct. Now, is this a replica or is it authentic? This is authentic. This piece is about 2,600 years old, and it dates back to the time of, uh, of probably Josiah and Manasseh. It's interesting that the Bible mentions in 2 Kings chapter 21 that Manasseh actually placed an Asherah in the temple itself and that his son Ammon continued in that practice. It wasn't until the time of Josiah, the young boy king that became king, uh, that this particular figurine was removed, and uh, many of the others were removed as well out of Jerusalem. So a figurine like that would become the object of worship. Correct. One of the things that that does for us is it puts the Bible story in perspective. It shows that these were not myths but in actual fact that they were real stories with real people that were facing real spiritual conflicts. That's correct. So that's your sixth find. What about your seventh? Well, number seven probably would have to be the Cyrus Cylinder, a cylinder that, uh, well, was found by Henry Austin Layard in Babylon and in the 1800s. This particular cylinder mentions the campaign that Cyrus, the king of Persia, took against Babylon and, of course, his name is mentioned in the book of Isaiah in chapter 44 and 45. Where's that cylinder today? That cylinder today is in the British Museum in London. And uh, what significance does that have to the Bible student? Was Cyrus's name mentioned in the Bible? It's mentioned in the book of Isaiah, and it's interesting that it's mentioned 150 years before the time of Daniel. So Cyrus attacks Babylon, overthrows it. 150 years before he was born, his name's mentioned in the Bible. Correct. And what specifically is written on the Cyrus Cylinder? The Cyrus Cylinder mentions that Cyrus, when he attacked and defeated Babylon, was welcomed into the city with open arms. He's called a shepherd, and uh, the people there, they, they greet him as, as one who is a deliverer rather than a conqueror, if you will. Isaiah chapter 44, verse 28 and onward names Cyrus, and it actually speaks about him as being the shepherd. We find that confirmed in biblical archaeology today. One of the major finds of the 20th century was the Dead Sea Scrolls. What significance do those scrolls have to you as a biblical archaeologist and as a Bible scholar? The Dead Sea Scrolls, I think, are very significant because for the first time going back several, uh, thousand, uh, several hundred years, about a thousand years before the latest manuscripts, we now have scrolls that are 
uh, almost identical to the Bibles that we have today, at least the versions that are translated from today. We have a portion of one of those scrolls, an original, on the screen. This is the book of Isaiah. How much of the book of Isaiah was discovered? We have the entire book of Isaiah, all 66 chapters of that book, and uh, it's wonderful to be able to see that today. It's prominently displayed in the Israel Museum, and to be able to look at that and, and be able to see and compare those texts over a thousand years apart and see that they are consistent. And it's written in the Hebrew language. It's written in the Hebrew language. Can you read that? Um, I could read it, but um, it's upside down. You are a Hebrew scholar, and I knew an eminent scholar like Dr. Hazel could certainly read Hebrew, even if it's upside down. Well, I, I could try, I could try, but I'd have to stand on my head, probably. <laughs> you know, it's an amazing thing to look at these scrolls. The Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered what year? They were discovered in 1947 by a Bedouin shepherd boy who was out looking for a lost goat, and, and there they were in a, in a cave. And how much of the Old Testament do we have, represent, representation of how many books? We not only have every book of the Old Testament, and until a couple of years, several years ago, we thought the book of Esther was missing, but today we're fairly certain that at least a couple of fragments of that book uh, have been also uncovered. And what is remarkable is multiple copies of books, so that we have multiple copies of the book of Deuteronomy, uh, Daniel, and, and many other books as well. One of the arguments sometimes given against the Bible is the idea that the Bible was not accurately copied. How do the Dead Sea Scrolls answer that question? The Dead Sea Scrolls provide an example of a copy of the Bible a thousand years before the the earliest copy that we had before 1947, and we see a, a consistency all the way through as the copyists copied that scripture down through the ages. We can rely on that today. Recently, there was a quite a remarkable find that shook the archaeological world regarding Israel and David. Yes, there has been a big conflict about the size of the Davidic monarchy, the time of Solomon and so forth. And in 1992, uh, a book came out that really was a shock to the scholarly world. A scholar in Sheffield, England, published a book entitled In Search of Ancient Israel and basically claimed that David was no more historical nor more authentic than the King Curtis or the King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table in British folklore. We have a picture of something called the David Stila. Tell us how that was discovered, when it was discovered, why it's important. The David Stila was discovered in 1993, a year after that book was published. It was uncovered in the site of Tel Dan in the very northern part of Israel on the Lebanese border. And the Stila mentions for the first time not only the house of Israel in a campaign document that an Aramean king probably Ben-Hadad of Syria, took against Israel and, and uh, the southern kingdom of Judah. But it mentions Judah not as the house of Judah, but as the house of David. So we have the house of Israel there as well as the house of David put side by side. And it's the first extra-biblical mention of David. You know, there are scholars that say, well, if David was as prominent a figure as he is, uh, he certainly should be mentioned outside the Bible, and there are some that argue that because they couldn't find his name outside the Bible, he didn't exist. But now, with this new discovery, we find David's name, as Dr. Hazel so uh, clearly mentioned, mentioned outside the Bible, confirming the authenticity, the reality of David's life and Israel's life. We have something from the time of David. What is this? This is a lamp from the time of David, and you can still see the burnt mark where it was burned in antiquity. It's 3,000 years old. That lamp that you are holding in your hand is 3,000 years old. It is. You know, it's amazing. I wonder. I wonder who lit their little home with that lamp. You know, David could have lit his little abode with a lamp similar to that when he wrote the book of Psalms. Correct. And you can almost imagine, you wonder, Dr. Hazel, whose fingerprints are on that lamp. Every time you excavate one of these, you wonder who held it last. And it reminds me of the passage in Psalms where the Bible says, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. But yet, you have something that is one of the oldest documents in the world. We do. I brought something with me today that is found on a little piece of clay. 
This is a tablet from Babylonia dating back 4,350 years. 4,350 years. How right. do we attest to its, ac to its authenticity? The date is on the, uh, on the, on the uh, tablet, and it uh, comes from a, a town in southern Iraq, from Babylonia, and uh, it is a temple receipt. A certain someone gave fish and fat as an offering to a temple in ancient Babylonia. What language is on the tablet? It's written in the oldest language known in the world, the language of Sumerian. And this particular language, uh, only a handful of people in the world can read, but uh, it is a very significant find. As we've been able to decipher these languages over the years, we've been able to not only gain an appreciation for the names of different kings like Nebuchadnezzar that we mentioned yesterday, Sennacherib, some of the other kings, but we can also see what their everyday life was like, how they traded in goods, how they bought and sold, and how their lives weren't much different than ours today. 4,350 years would take us back to almost the flood, wouldn't it? That's correct. Tower of Babel. That's right. So would this be one of the first languages that we know of after the Tower of Babel. This is the oldest language that we know of in the world. It's, it's right at the beginning. Helps to confirm the fact that God indeed moved back there at the Tower of Babel and that from a single language, we don't know what that language was, but it helps to confirm language at a very early period of time. Dr. Hassel, in a final comment, what has this archaeological study done for you personally and your personal faith in the last 20 years? You know, when you are working in the Middle East and you walk through these cities and you're able to discover artifacts like this on a day-to-day -day basis, what it does for me is you can always look at life and you can look at things like a glass half empty and half full. I can be a critic and I can say, well, there's a lot of names in the Bible that we don't know. I look at the Bible and I see all the names that we have found through archaeological research. I look at the Bible and I see that Nebuchadnezzar did exist, Sennacherib existed, Necho, the Egyptian pharaoh existed. In fact, we could probably list 40 to 50 names of rulers and kings. And I have to say that that helps confirm my faith, that these stories really took place, that these events happened, and that these people and the places that they lived in actually existed. One of the neat things that was just discovered last year was someone was reading a tablet like this one in the basement of the British Museum, and for the first time found a name mentioned in the biblical book of Jeremiah, and in that name was able to find that uh, very obscure government official in Babylonia that's mentioned there. Now, to me, that's exciting. And we don't know how many more tablets like that need to be read, how many more discoveries can be made. When you look at the ancient world, only 1% of what could be excavated has been excavated. And so it behooves us to continue to work in the Middle East and find more year by year. Thank you, Dr. Hosel. You've encouraged our faith. You've inspired our faith. You've blessed us. Thank you so much. Good to be here. Thank you, Mark. God bless. Thanks. Faith has evidence to satisfy the questions of our mind. But for faith to be genuine, it must be personal. Christine comes to sing about her faith in the living Christ that fills her heart and must spill out in song. Oh, the golden 
My topic tonight is the rumble of a crumbling world, a message of hope for our time. Come with me this evening back, back to the city of Pompeii. The Bay of Naples is a beautiful, magnificent harbor. That bay in AD 79 was the home of the city of Pompeii. Pompeii was an incredibly luxurious city. It was a resort town where many of the very wealthy Romans vacationed. It was a city of commerce, a city of incredible wealth. Pompeii was a luxurious city, a beautiful city, a magnificent city. Pompeii was one of those cities that if you wanted to buy something, Pompeii was the place to go. It was a magnificent city that had 25 street fountains, four public baths, and a large amphitheater. It was a city of commerce, a city of materialism, it was a city of sports, a city of luxury, and a city of immorality. The inhabitants of Pompeii were incredibly wealthy and incredibly materialistic. Silks from China could have been bought in Pompeii. Silver and gold was traded in Pompeii. Imported art and statutes were brought to Pompeii. What a magnificent and incredible city. The Forum was the economic and religious and political center of Pompeii. It was buzzing with hectic activity. If you wanted to be where the action was in old Pompeii, where the trading was taking place, you'd often go down to the Forum. This is the Magellan of the marketplace. Here there were exotic fruits that were imported for all over, from all over the Mediterranean world. If you wanted to buy oranges, grapes, dates, figs, you could buy them here at the Magellan. On one fresco, that the archaeologists have uncovered in Pompeii, we read these words, salve lucre, meaning welcome money. In other words, the inhabitants of Pompeii were saying, our arms are wide open for all of the money that the trade is bringing to us. The inhabitants of Pompeii were cultured, 
They were sophisticated, like this fresca from Pompeii indicates and this fresca shows. But Pompeii was not only a center of commerce, wealth, and industry, uh, and, uh, and handicrafts, and trade. Here is the Temple of Jupiter. There were three major pagan temples in Pompeii, including the Temple of Jupiter, the Temple of Apollo, and the Temple of, of Isis. It was a center for pagan gods. The inhabitants of Pompeii turned their back on the true God, and they believed in idols and their pagan gods. This is the temple of Apollo, the temple of one of the chief gods of Pompeii. The sanctuary of Augustus, or the altar to Augustus Caesar, was there. The belief was that Augustus Caesar also was a, the incarnation of a god. So it was the center of false gods as well. In Pompeii, wine flowed freely. It was a sensual city filled with sexual immorality and prostitution. And prostitution was very well accepted in this luxurious, wealthy, materialistic, pagan resort town. It was a common act, and prostitution was common. Young girls were taken to Pompeii, and they were initiated into the prostitution cults and rites. So when you think of Pompeii, you're thinking of a materialistic city, you're thinking of a cultured city, you're thinking of a city of pagan gods, you're thinking of a resort city, you're thinking of a sensual city, and a city of sexual immorality. On August 24, A.D. 79, Mount Vesuvius erupted. But here's the amazing thing. History tells us that the volcano was rumbling for weeks and months in advance. The inhabitants of Pompeii should have known, but they were too involved in buying and selling. They were too involved in the materialistic values of life. They were too involved in the sensuality and sexuality of life. The volcano was rumbling. It was about ready to explode but they were busy, occupied, enthralled, enchanted with the here and now. They felt very secure. They had a luxurious city. Theirs was one of the most beautiful cities in all of Europe. Certainly, nothing could happen. They had heard the rumblings of Vesuvius before. They had seen the belch of smoke before. Why be a calamity howler? Why get upset now? Didn't these things happen before? But when the volcano erupted, the sky was darkened and blackened. People began to run and shriek in horror. The volcano erupted. Some tried to get away on chariots, and the volcanic lava was so hot that even today you can see the ruts of the chariot wheels where people tried to get away there in the pavement of the ruins of Pompeii. It is amazing to look at these bodies, bodies that are real people encrusted with lava, bodies lying there for over, for over 1,900 years now. Some of these bodies, the people have money in their hands and coins and they're actually grasping those coins. They reached out for material values only to be let down. For in the epistolate, Pliny the Younger, who was an eyewitness to the destruction of Pompeii, says this, darkness overspread us, not like that of a moonless or cloudy night, but of a room when it shut up and the lamp put out. You would hear the shrieks of women and children crying and the shouts of men. Some were seeking their children, others their parents. Pliny goes on in his eyewitness description. Some praying to die from the very fear of dying. Many lifted their hands to the gods, but for greater part, they imagined that there were no gods left anywhere and that the last and eternal light was come upon the world. These people had worshipped the false gods. These people had worshipped the images of stone. And they said, now in our crisis, our gods have let us down. Now in our crisis, there's no god to be found anywhere. It's the end. We serve a god who will not let us down in a time of crisis. We serve a God who's there with us when we need him. I love that old song, just when I need him, Jesus is near. Just when I falter, just when I fear. The inhabitants 
of Pompey should have known. They denied the warnings, and today we see their bodies encrusted in lava. We see their bodies strewn over the sands of time, and they echo and re-echo down the chorus of time that materialism cannot satisfy, that sexuality cannot satisfy, that money cannot satisfy, that the gods of this world cannot give you security. I wonder though, I wonder, is history repeating itself? We walk down the streets of Pompeii, we see in the museums there the agony on the faces of those that sold out cheap for the material values of life. I wonder, do we hear the rumblings of a distant volcano in our world today? Do we hear the rumblings? Are we ignoring those rumblings? The rumblings in the stock market, the rumblings in an economic disaster, the rumblings of natural disasters, of hurricanes, famines, floods around the world, the rumblings of war between nations, the rumblings of rising crime and violence. Are we too secure? Are we living next to a volcano like Vesuvius, a social, political, emotional disaster that's gonna break upon our world and sweep people away who are unprepared. I wonder, is there a message of hope and deliverance for us? Is there a message that prepares this society and this generation for overwhelming events that are soon to take place? It would be surprising if there wasn't a message to prepare the world for these events. In the days of Noah, before the flood came, God sent his last message to the world in Noah. In the days of Jesus, God sent John the Baptist to prepare the way for his first coming. I wonder, if there were a message for today, and if that message were in the Bible, where do you think that message would be found? What book of the Bible do you think would have that message if there was a message of hope for today? What, what, what book of the Bible would that be? The book of what? Revelation. Revelation is the last book of the Bible written to the last generation of men and women to live on a planet called Earth. Revelation begins with these words, the revelation of Jesus Christ. Let's go to the island of Patmos. It was here that John, secluded in a cave, had a vision and he wrote the book of Revelation. My wife and I Dr. Hassel were in that cave with a group of others this past summer. It was here in that cave that Revelation was written. God gave to John a glimpse of the future. In the heart of the book of Revelation, God reveals his end time message. God reveals a message of warning, a message of encouragement, a message of hope for you and for me. Revelation, the 14th chapter, let's read it together. Revelation 14, verse 6 and 7. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel. Notice, to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. The Bible goes on as it describes that message and says, saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come. And then the Bible says, and worship him who made heaven and the earth and the sea and the springs of waters. If this message is as important as Noah's message was in his day, if it's as important as John the Baptist's message was in his day, it's certainly worth spending some time studying it, isn't it? It's worth it to get away from the television for a few hours and concentrate on what God's Word says. If God has a message for a world that is rumbling, a world that is on the verge of the greatest events in history, a world that's on the verge of political, social, and economic disaster, if God has a message of hope, if God has a message of meaning, if God has a message of purpose, it's worth it for us to take a serious look at it. What do you think? 
Well, the first thing we notice about this message is that it's carried by three angels in mid-heaven. This is God's symbolic way of describing that the message is one of urgent importance that has the stamp of heaven. Now, the Bible, in describing this message, talks about it as a universal message. The Bible says, I saw another angel fly in the mid-heaven. The angel flies. It's a message that goes rapidly, quickly. And it says, the message goes to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. It's a universal message. This is not a message for Africa alone, not a message for Indra South America alone. It's not a message for the United States. It's not a message merely for Europe. Here's a message that leaps across geographical boundaries. Here's a message that breaks all linguistic barriers. Here is a universal message for all humanity to prepare them for the greatest events in the history of the world. Now, what event does this message prepare all humanity for? Revelation 14, verse 6 to 12, talk about the message. Revelation 14, verse 12 to 20, talk about the event that the message prepares men and women for. What event is coming? Revelation 14, verse 14 to 16, then I looked. A white cloud, I, and I saw a white cloud, and on the cloud sat one like the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown. The Bible describes this scene, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud. Thrust in your sickle and reap, for the time has come for you to reap. For the harvest of the earth is ripe. John looked up into heaven, and he saw Jesus sitting on his throne. He saw Jesus leaving that throne with a sickle in his hand to harvest the earth. What is the harvest? What's the meaning of Revelation's symbol of the harvest? Jesus told a story, a parable, and this is what he said in that parable. Matthew 13, verse 39, Jesus told the story about the wheat and tares, and he said, the enemy who sowed them, that's the tares, is the devil. Read the rest of the text with me, please. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are the angels. So the harvest, according to the Bible, is the end of the age, or the end of what? The world. So the event that we see of Jesus coming to reap earth's final harvest represents the coming of Christ, the harvest. The harvest is a time when the fruit is fully ripe. In our world tonight, there are some of those that are sold out for Christ. They're totally committed to Christ. There are others of those that have turned their back on Christ and they could care less about Jesus. But there is a great middle ground today where people haven't decided for or against Christ. That middle ground is shrinking all the time. Have you noticed that there's a polarization in our world? Have you noticed that the spiritual are getting more spiritual? The committed are getting more committed. The sold out for Christ are getting more sold out for Christ. And the bold and the brazen and those that are blatantly against Christ are becoming more blatant in their opposition to Christ. Have you noticed that? That there are two classes developing in our world and soon every human being will make their final irrevocable decision for or against Christ. Soon, every human being will be on one side or on the other. Soon, there will be no neutrality. And it's the message of Revelation 14, verse 6 to 12. There is, it's that message. It's that message that prepares men and women for the coming of that final harvest. Now, the Bible describes the fact that Jesus Christ is coming that history is not secular, that it goes round and round and round. The Bible says history has a beginning. God created the world. It says history has an ending. All of history is moving to one glorious climactic event, the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. One day, the end of sin will take place. One day, righteousness will reign. You may be treated unfairly down here, but one day Jesus Christ is going to be reign in righteousness and everything that has been thrust against you that is unfair and unjust will be set right. One day 
poverty and pestilence and pollution will be over. One day, disease and disaster and death will be over. One day, war and worry and want will be over. One day, confusion and chaos and calamity will be over. One day, the sky will be glorious with the illumination and the lightning of Christ's coming. One day, He will come again. All of history is moving to that grand, that glorious coming event of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. But God has sent a message, a message to prepare men and women for that event. If God is so gracious to send us that message, oh man, I'm kind of tired. I'm not too interested in the Bible. I think I'll watch television for the next three hours. Hey, look. If these events are going to take place, great events in the history of the world, if Jesus is going to come, isn't it worth spending a little time understanding how to be prepared for the events that will take this world like an overwhelming surprise, like the flood did in, in Noah's day? Isn't it worth it to look at this last day message? Tonight's message is really an introductory message to the entire book of Revelation. Everything we've done in the lecture series, in our first six lectures, leads up to a preparation, a foundation for us all to understand the book of Revelation and to understand it more clearly and to understand it more powerfully. Revelation 14 verse 6 says, Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel. The Bible says that the gospel message of Jesus would go to the ends of the earth. What is this last message? What is this final message to prepare men and women for the coming of Jesus? It is the everlasting gospel. What is the gospel? The gospel is the good news that through Jesus Christ we can be set free. The gospel is the good news that through Jesus our sins can be forgiven. Through Jesus, the bonds that bind us can be gone. Through Jesus, the condemnation can be gone. Through Jesus, the guilt that afflicts our mind can be gone. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, we can be set free. Through Jesus, we can have peace, and through Jesus, we can have new life. What is the gospel? It's the good news that I should have wore the crown of thorns. It's the good news that I should have born that cross. It's the good news that although the wages of sin are death, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. What is the gospel? This gospel that must go to the whole world before Jesus comes. It is the good news that when I look at that cross, I see Jesus dying, not as a martyr for a good cause, but I see Jesus dying in my place. I see the sacrifice of Christ in my behalf. I see Jesus bearing all of my guilt, all of my shame, all of my condemnation. If you try to bear your guilt, it will crush out your life. If you try to bear your guilt, it will simply give you depression, discouragement. If you try to push that guilt down, it will simply give you a heart attack, a nervous breakdown, and stomach ulcers. Coming to Jesus. I say, Lord, you bore my guilt. You bore my shame. Yes, my head tells me I am imperfect and never measure up. But you are my perfection. You are my righteousness. You measured up for me. I accept everything you are. And I release everything I am. That's the gospel. It is the good news that Jesus bore the cross. It's the good news that the shame of guilt can be gone. It's the good news that he's resurrected from the dead. Man steps off a mountain and goes down. God steps off a mountain and goes up. Because the law of gravity cannot hold the creator of gravity down. And Jesus ascended higher and higher and higher and higher. He was out of sight of earth and inside of heaven. The golden gates of heaven flung open and Jesus came through. And as he did, the angels sang, glory to God in the highest. Where is Jesus today? He is risen from the dead. He is in the temple of heaven. What is the gospel? The gospel is he forgives, but the gospel is he lives as well as forgives. And because he is alive, he reaches out to me tonight. He reaches out to you tonight. What are you struggling with? What habit shackles you? What attitude binds you? 
Jesus, the living Christ, can change your life. That's the gospel. He's not only my Savior for my past sin, He's the Lord of my life that is life transforming, whatever you're facing tonight. The gospel is good news. Christ died for our sins. Christ lived the perfect life we should have lived. Christ rose from the dead. Christ ascended to the Father. His strength is yours. His power is yours. His grace is yours. His mercy is yours. His strength is yours tonight. I was holding a series like this down in Australia. And I remember when I met for the first time a guy I'll call Bob. He was a rocker and uh, played in rock bands, rock concert, and then he became a bouncer at a nightclub. I mean, he was a strong guy, muscles bulging, you know, one of those big chested guys, weightlifter guys, tattoos, he, he, uh, earrings in both ears. I mean, it was rough and tumble. I met him after the meeting, and I like to get acquainted with people, so I said, what do you do, Bob? He said, I'm a bouncer at a bar. He said, I take care of them. They get out of line. I know how to crack their heads together, throw them out in the street. His father was a Christian. Father invited him to our meetings, and he came. One night I talked about Jesus. I talked about how that peace can fill your heart. Talked about how that Jesus can fill your life. Talked about how you can be made over again, how the purpose of your life can be fulfilled. Tears came down his face, and I remember the night he came out and gave me a big hug and the cracks I felt in my back and still feel. <laughs> you know, he came to Jesus. I had the joy of seeing him baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. He found the gospel. He found forgiveness for sin. He found new power in his life. How can I find peace? The gospel is the answer. Somebody says, I need a pill. Yeah, you do. I agree. The gospel. <laughs> the everlasting gospel is the answer to the problem of sickness. It's the answer to the problem of, of guilt and shame and fear. The gospel of Jesus Christ reaches out to you. It's more than a theory. You can open your heart and find that living Christ, God's last day message to the world. The Bible says, Matthew 24, verse 14, this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations. Then shall the end come. The Bible says that before Jesus comes, this eternal message would go around the world, that hearts would be touched and lives would be changed. And in my ministry, I see that. My wife and I travel around the world. We just came back from South Africa, the gospel powerfully impacting there. We were in China about two years ago. We saw the gospel impacting in China. God's doing some amazing things. We have a 10-year project in India. We're on year number seven now. It's going into year number eight. We started in 2000. We've been going to India for 10 years, sponsoring Bible workers, building churches, holding big meetings. And we've seen God move in India incredible ways. Hindus coming to Christ. It's amazing what God is doing around the world, South and Inter-America. God is doing something amazing down in South America, Brazil. There is a resurgence of interest in spirituality all over the world. God is moving powerfully. Former communist lands are opening to the gospel. A message like predicted in the Bible indeed is spanning the globe. Indeed, it's going around the world. Not only will the gospel message of Jesus Christ, his saving power, his lordship, go around the world. But the Bible says in Revelation chapter 14, verse 7, that there is a distinct message specifically tailor-made for this generation. And that message of long-neglected truths, truths that need to be restored before Jesus comes, that message of the restoration of truth is the heart and essence of this message in Revelation about Jesus and these three angels. The Bible says, and I saw three angels flying in the midst of heaven. The first angel speaks and he gives a message of the everlasting gospel. And the angel says, let's notice it together, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come. This message is unique. It is tailor-made for the 21st century. Let's look at the three parts of it. Fear God, give glory to Him, the hour of His judgment is come. What does it mean to fear God? Does it mean to shake and tremble and be afraid of God? The message also says, worship Him who made heaven, earth, the sea, and the springs of waters. So fear God, give glory to Him, the hour of His judgment is come, 
and worship the one that made heaven and earth, the sea, and the fountains of waters. What do we call the one who made heaven, earth, sea, and the fountains of waters? We call him the creator. So here's a message calling us to fear God, a message calling us to give glory to God, a message calling us to get ready for the judgment, and a message calling us to worship the creator. Now, what does it mean to fear God? Does it mean to shake and tremble and be afraid of God? What does that mean? What is this specifically a call to do? To fear God means to respect or reverence God by obeying Him. For example, look at Ecclesiastes chapter 12, and we'll notice what the Bible says. Here's a call to obey God. Let's go to the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 13, reading it together. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. So to fear God means to obey God, to respect God. We live in a society where people say, look, you have your truth, I have my truth. There's nothing right or nothing wrong. There's no objective moral standard. You do what you think is right, let me do what I think is right, but don't pass judgment on me at all. We live in a society that says, look, if it feels good, do it. If it tickles your pleasure sensation, do it. We live in a society that says, don't strap me in. Don't bind me in. A society that says, look, the commandments are a something for another age. And so we live in a society where immorality and adultery are commonplace. We live in a society where robbery and thievery are commonplace. We live in a society where the name of Jesus is dragged through the dust, taking the name of the Lord thy God in vain. That name that the angels bow at and sing, holy, holy, holy. We live in a society where children say, look, honor your father and your mother. I, I want to do what I want to do. In this society, a society where the rumble of the crumbling world echoes in our ears, where the rumble of the Vesuvius volcano of emotional, physical, psychological trauma and disaster is coming, where the storm is coming, relentless in its fury. We hear the rumbles in the social world, in the economic world, the political world. We hear them around us. God is calling us back to obedience. God is calling us not to some superficial Christian experience that's, that's, that's merely external. God is calling us back. Those of us who have accepted Him as Savior, He's calling us to accept Him as Lord wherever you are tonight. There is a call of God to your life. God has reigns upon your life. God is calling you to the happy way of living, the way of obedience. The Bible says in the book of Proverbs, Proverbs 3, verse 1, my son, do not what? Forget my law, but let your heart keep my commands. In a generation that says we have no higher standard than our own mind, to that generation, God is calling us back, back to obedience, back to faithfulness to his commands. He's calling us to our knees to say, Lord, I want to be done with anything that's not in harmony with your will. Lord, the passion of my heart is to do your will. The passion of my heart, Lord, is to obey you. Revelation chapter 14, verse 12, talks about God's last day people. Talks about a people that live just before the return of our Lord. And it says, Revelation 14, 12, reading, here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. God's last day message calls us back to keeping His commandments. Will God have a people that are faithful at end time? Will He? Yes. Will God have a people that are loyal at end time? Yes. Will God have a people that are obedient at end time? What do you say? Yes. These last day people have heard the message of Jesus as Savior. They've found forgiveness in Jesus. They've heard the message of Jesus as Lord their lives have been transformed by His grace. This last day message, fear God, respect Him, obey Him. Then it says, give glory to Him. What does it mean to give glory to God? How do we glorify God? The Bible helps us to understand the answer to this question. What does it mean to give glory to God? The Bible describes it this way when it says 
to give glory to God means to praise God in every aspect of our lifestyle, in the things we eat, in the things we drink, in what we take into our minds and consume. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 31, reading together. Therefore, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. In a generation where people say, look, my body is a fun house. Whatever tickles my sensations, whatever stimulates my desires, whatever satisfies my fleshly nature, I don't care what impact it has on my body, but it makes me feel good. Jesus says, whatever you eat or drink, do all to the glory of God. Our bodies are not a fun house, they're a temple, the temple of the living God. In a society of people abusing their bodies, shooting drugs in their veins, consuming alcohol and destroying brain cells, in a society where men and women have turned their back on God's commands, God says, I'm calling you back to obedience. God says, I'm calling you to give your body to me as a living sacrifice, to open your heart and mind to me so that I can fill your body with my spirit and it can be a temple of the living God. Whatever you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. This is the call of the hour. This is God's final last day message for men and women living on planet earth. The Bible says, fear God, obey God. The Bible says, give glory to God. The Bible says, worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of waters. Worship the one that made. What does it mean to worship the one that made? Who is this message actually calling us to worship? It's a message calling us back, back to worship the creator of the heaven and the earth. Can you think of a message more appropriate in this age of evolution than a message that calls us back, back to worship the Creator? We did not evolve. We're not simply skin covering bone. We're not simply some genetic accident. You see, the concept of evolution destroys your self-esteem. If I simply evolved, if I'm no more than skin covering bones, if I'm some genetic accident, if I'm some like leaf blowing in the autumn breeze, if I have no more worth than some old Pepsi can or Coke can that somebody stepped on, if I'm simply like a pebble that somebody kicks, then life is meaningless and purposeless. But if I've been created by God, if God shaped me and fashioned me, if I'm special to God, if there is a place in His heart that only I can satisfy with my love. If God created me, and if God knows my name, and if God cares for me, that makes all the difference in the world. Get your head out of the dust. Get your head out of the earth and the dirt. Let the gloom pass from you. God created you, God shaped you, God fashioned you, God cares for you. In a generation of low self-esteem and crushed self-worth, and when I look in the mirror and I say, my nose is too pointed, and my ears are like Dumbo's too big, and my mouth, and I look in the mirror and I say, I don't look like all those Hollywood heroes. I don't look like all those Hollywood models. models. Poor me. Jesus says, I created you and I like you the way you are. Jesus says, I fashioned you. Here is God's last day message, a call to worship the Creator. And when we worship the one on the Creator's day who created heavens and the earth, when we worship him as creator, we find our true self and our true identity in the one that made us. We find our true roots and worth in the one that made us. And we sense that we're sons and daughters of God, created by the king of the universe, redeemed by Jesus Christ. This is Earth's last day message. From the minutest atom to the grandest galaxy, all nature calls us to worship our loving creator. All nature calls us to praise our loving creator. 
The very basis of worship is the fact that God made us. We did not make ourselves. We did not create ourselves. Revelation chapter 4 verse 11 says, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. We come to worship the creator of the universe on the creator's day, and we say you're worthy to receive glory, honor, and praise. So in an age of evolution, revelation is calling us back, back to worship the creator of heaven and earth. What's Revelation's urgent end time message that is tailor-made that's designed for this generation? In an age where men and women say the self is the center, God calls us to obey Him. In an age where we make our bodies a fun house, God calls us to glorify Him. In an age of evolution, God calls us to worship Him. You see, this message tells us what we're supposed to be doing, praising, worshiping, obeying God. It tells us why we're supposed to be doing it. He created us. He fashioned us. We are not our own. You and I did not one day in the far distant past say, ah, I think life would be a good idea. I think I want to be born. You didn't say that, did you? Hey, why is it that you're not a mosquito? Somebody just see a mosquito here, swab it. Why aren't you an, an elephant? Why aren't you a giraffe? Why aren't you a sweet potato that somebody just ate for lunch? <laughs> or a tossed salad? Why are you you? The only reason you're you is you were conceived in the mind of God before you were conceived in the womb of your mother. Amen. And a loving God brought together the genes and chromosomes that made you you. If he gave me life, if he is my creator, the least I can do is give the life he created me for back to him. Amen. Revelation tells us what we're supposed to be doing to obey God, give him our lives, why we're supposed to be doing he created us, and why it's so vitally important. We are living in a unique time in earth's history. And the Bible says, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment, what? Next two words are what? Has come. Not will come. Has come. Does has come make a difference between has come and will come? Has come is now. Could it be that we're living in the judgment hour? Could it be that God is settling the destinies with all humanity? Could it be that the choices we make on earth settle our eternal destinies? Could it be that there's a judgment before Jesus comes? Revelation is a book about eternal choices. Revelation calls all humanity to make eternal choices. Revelation calls us to choose. Revelation 22 verse 12 says, and behold, I'm coming quickly. And my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. If Jesus is coming to give out the rewards, there must be a judgment before he comes to determine what reward people receive, his children receive when he comes. Jesus is coming again. And the decisions we make now in this life determine our eternal destiny in the by and by tomorrow when he comes. Jesus says, Revelation 22, verse 11, He who is unjust, let him be unjust still. He who is filthy, let him be filthy still. He who is righteous, let him be righteous still. He who is holy, let him be holy still. When Jesus comes, there's the just and the unjust. When Jesus comes, there's the righteous and the unrighteous. When Jesus comes, there's the holy and the unholy. When Jesus comes, the destinies of all humanity are settled. We are living, the Bible says, the hour of God's judgment has come. We're living in the judgment hour. Some people say, well, you're not morally responsible for your choices. I, uh, I, I do what I do just because what my parents did and what others did. Did you read that story? A fellow was driving through one of the Midwestern cities of America, and in front of him, can you believe it? In front of him, there was an armored car. The armored car went around the corner, and the back door flew open, and sacks of money, did you read the story, fell out on the street and they went everywhere. The fellow thought that he had hit the jackpot, parked his car, jumped out, the truck kept driving of course, he scooped up all that money, the sacks, threw it in the trunk of his car, and he thought, I am off to Mexico. I will live in the sunshine forever on the beach, I've got enough money. Did you read the news report? True story. Came to the Mexican border and some kind policeman checked his trunk of his car. 
found all that money, put the guy in jail. When the guy got in jail, he got a high-powered lawyer, and the lawyer argued that the man wasn't responsible because the company was at fault because the latch on the truck door was not properly secured, and when the back door flew open and the money came on the street, his client was temporarily insane seeing all that money. <laughs> That's right. That's what the guy argued. And the judge bought it and let the guy free. <laughs> Only in America. <laughs> Before the judgment bar of God, God's not going to make any mistake. It's not, oh, I'm not responsible. God's message in Revelation calls us back, back to responsibility before God, back to take responsibility for the way we live. It's a call in the judgment hour. It's a call to commit our lives to Jesus Christ. The first angel's message is a call, a call to loving obedience. The message is a call to give glory to God in our lives. The message is a call to worship the Creator. The message is a call. It is a call here to urgently give our lives to Christ and to live godly lives in the light of the final judgment. It's an appeal to you and to me. No more business as usual. No more pleasures as usual. Now, Revelation goes on. The first angel flies. Tonight, I introduced just in a moment the second and third angel. We're going to be studying those every night. The second angel flies. He reveals truth, but he exposes error. Error that has come into the Christian church. The Bible says another angel followed saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city. Spiritual Babylon, not Old Testament Babylon, spiritual Babylon, fallen. Why? Because it says she's made all nations drink the wine of the wrath of her fornication. What is wine in the Bible? False doctrine. False religious doctrine flows through Christianity. What is that false religious doctrine? We're going to be studying that night after night. That's why you can't miss a night of these meetings. False doctrines would come into the Christian church through a false religious system called Babylon. What are those doctrines that would come into the Christian church directly from Babylonian paganism? You will be shocked and surprised as we open the Bible and talk about these messages of these angels. You don't want to miss one night of this lecture series. And then the Bible talks, the third angel talks about a beast power that would rise, seven heads, ten horns, crowns upon his heads, a beast like a bear, a leopard, a dragon, a lion. He would rise up out of the sea, the Bible says. And the Bible says that in the final days of earth's history, God would call us from worshiping the beast to worshiping the creator, that there would be a great conflict over worship in the last days. The third angel follows them saying with a loud voice, if any man worships the beast in his image, receives his mark in his forehead or his hand. Mark of the beast in the image, the forehead, what's that about? We'll unfold that every single night. And the Bible says, he himself shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God. We'll talk about who is the beast, what is the mark, and how you can keep from receiving the mark of the beast. Vital messages. Revelation 14, 7 says, worship the Creator. What's that all about? How do you worship the Creator? Has he given a flag, a sign? Don't worship the beast. What's that all about? Who's the beast? Keep the commandments of God. Earth's last hour is unfolding. The sands in the hourglass of time are running out. And God's last day message warns against deceptions in the last days. And God is calling us. He's calling us to, with an appeal to surrender completely to Him and open our hearts for His truth in these final moments. This is a call to surrender. This is a call to open our hearts to Jesus. A few years, a number of years ago, young boy, playing in the streets, first part of the 20th century, 1900s, playing in the streets on a little bike, hit by a car, injured, brought to the hospital, losing blood rapidly. As he lost that blood, he needed a blood transfusion. In those days, they didn't have blood plasma. They called this boy's father. The boy's father had the same type, blood type, as the boy. And the father said, I will give my blood for my son. 
And as the father stood there looking at the form of his son, almost lifeless, near death, blood was taken from the arm of the father directly into his son. And the father watched that blood flow through the plastic tube, and he said to the doctor, Doctor, if you need to, take it all. Doctor, if you need to, to save the life of my boy, take every drop of blood. Jesus hung on the cross, and he said, Father, take it all, take every drop, because I want my children to be saved. Amen. If Jesus gave every drop of blood for me, in these final moments, I want to give all my life to him. Amen. Do you hear Jesus speaking to your heart? Do you hear Jesus appealing to your soul? You may have just turned on the Hope Channel at 3 a.m., Christ speaking to you. You may be watching in an auditorium or a little church, Christ is speaking to you. You may be watching here. In times like these, we need the Bible. We need the bedrock faith in Scripture. In times like these, we need Jesus. We need something more than a surface religion. Why not bow your head as Charles comes to sing? Christine, in times like these. In times like these, you need a Savior. In times like these, you need an Would you like to lift your hand and say, Jesus, I want my anchor to hold. Jesus, I want to be anchored in the solid rock. Jesus, I give my life to you. Would you like to do that right now, wherever you are? You want to survive. You want to live through the crisis. You want your life anchored in Jesus Christ. You want to be secure in him. You want to give him your life and your all. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, thank you tonight for Jesus. Thank you for his love. Thank you for his goodness. Thank you for his power. Thank you for reaching out to save us. And tonight, in times like these, we need a savior. Times like these, we need an anchor. Times like these, we reach out to you and give you our all in Christ's name. Amen and amen. Remember our next meeting tomorrow night, all eyes on the temple. Now as we go off the air tonight, listen. As Charles and Christine say, in the times like these, you need your Bible. In times like these, oh, be not idle, be very sure, be very sure. Yes, he's a one.